Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can also find us uh, on iTunes as well as an RSS feed and get the entire back catalog there. Uh, I also have here Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Hey, Brock. It's the uh, middle of the summer. Uh, school's out. You're you're just, I imagine, slacking off for the entire summer, right? I mean, that's that's what all you academic researchers do during the summer. Am I right? Uh, I'm actually trying to replace our entire cluster by sometime next year, so I got a big, big project coming up. Oh, so, so you're working no. hard. Oh, <laughs> no. no. No rest for the wicked. How terrible. No vacation for me. Uh, right. Okay. What, uh, other, what other deadlines we got coming up? Isn't There's a supercomputing BOF deadline is coming up end of July, I think. Yeah, I think there's a couple of supercomputing things, but I don't think there's really anything else that I'm aware of coming up, so I think that's yeah, the only okay. one. Okay. All right. Well, what do we got today? Okay, so today we are going to be covering Shifter. This is a often requested topic, and we finally got a hold of some people. So we have with us Shane and Doug. Uh, Shane, Doug, why don't you take an opportunity to introduce yourselves? All right. Hey, I'm Shane Cannon. Uh, so I'm a member here at NERSC at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, my background is, my educational background is in uh, physics, so I've got a PhD in physics from Duke. But all my professional career has been in high-performance computing and technical computing. Uh, everything from system administration to being a group lead uh, at Oak Ridge and a group lead here at, at NERSC. And right now, I'm in the data analytics and services group um, where I work on trying to help users uh, use our systems more effectively, especially on the data side. And then I'm also a uh, member of a project called Keybase, which is a genomics platform that we're trying to build up. And hi, I'm Doug Jacobson. I also work at NERSC at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, my educational background is in bioinformatics uh, at the University of Michigan, uh, but I've spent my entire professional career here at NERSC, uh, uh, ranging from user services to uh, to systems administration and systems and system software engineering, uh, which is where the Shifter project really comes in. Yeah. Okay, so uh, where does uh, what is Shifter? Um, maybe I'll take I'll start off, and Doug can uh, chime in. It's maybe useful just to think about why why we invented this. Um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to we've got a growing number of users that are trying to use systems like Cori, which are is our Cray system, to do a broader set of things than just modeling and simulation, sort of the traditional HPC workload. So we want to enable more users to use the systems uh, more easily. And we saw containers, Docker containers, is an interesting way to kind of open that door. Uh, but you couldn't really run Docker on our system. So Shifter was really a, a, a response to that problem and trying to think through the issues with Docker, and but still trying to enable as much of that uh, capability on our systems. So, at, you know, what it does is it allows you to run containers on our, on our systems and other HPC systems at scale securely without, you know, some of the side effects of Docker. Anything to add, Doug? Uh, yeah. So, this has also been not a, a recent uh, sort mm -hmm. of uh, investigation for NERSC. I mean, NERSC has been in, in our non um, Capability machines, uh, so so things like our, our traditional cluster systems. We've been doing uh, forms of virtualization for, for quite a long time, starting with Shane's uh, Chas uh, project. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, really, we've been dabbling in this kind of thing since 2005. Yeah, for a decade or so, over a decade. Yeah, yeah. But but Shifter is just the the latest uh, sort of incarnation of that. But it's the first one that allows the user to directly control the uh, every aspect of the environment. I would like to clarify, though, that Shifter is not actually a container system. It's a container compatibility system. Yeah. Uh, we don't do anything. Uh, so, uh, you know, a container uh, would 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 imply uh, both sort of the operating environment, which is really what Shifter is thinking about, but it also thinks about resource limitations, and that's really the job of the resource manager. And so, actually, one of the design principles of Shifter is that it does not at all. Uh, try to uh, do resource limitations, it leaves that to, uh, in our case, it's Slurm. Uh, that's our yeah. workload manager. But So we, we really don't do a whole lot with C groups with Shifter, and that's, that's by design. Yeah. 
All right, so Shane, let me zoom in on something you just said there um, that was kind of interesting. Um, so this is not a shifter is not a container system in itself, and it's in addition to Docker. But you made this interesting comment that you can't run Docker on your systems. Could you give a little insight into why and what some of the problems are? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> and it's kind of multifaceted. So um, probably the main, the biggest reason is sort of security concerns. So. If you're trying to run stock Docker, if anybody's played around with Docker and sort of tried to do this, you can once you sort of allow a user to use Docker, then you've kind of given them the keys to the kingdom on that that node or that system, right? And so, since we want to allow users to use Docker images, but also be able to access things like shared file systems, it really would be a non-starter for us to just put Docker in unaltered and just open it up for users to run containers. There's also other problems with, in, in a kind of HPC environment that we're running on the craze, there's no local disk. Docker, you can work around this, but Docker really assumes local disk and that would be problematic. We really wanna make sure that the solution that we put forward can scale to the full size of our systems. And so there's uh, you know, constraints around that. And then um, we also wanted to make sure that we could allow, uh, I, we could run it on systems maybe that didn't have the most modern kernels on them. So some of the systems can be a little, you guys know, the, the kernels can sometimes lag in the HPC space. And we didn't want to have a, this dependency like you had to be running the, the latest version of uh, the kernel to be able to use the system. So, you know, you just told us what Shifter is. I mean, why containers in the first place? Why is this uh, a useful technology for science? Yeah, and this is, I think this is good because this is something we're really excited about. Um, so first and foremost, I think what's interesting about containers is they really give you a framework for enabling reproducible science. So, um, you know, one of the challenges in technical computing is you're, you're running your application, but things are shifting, you're changing out from underneath you a lot of times as the systems are upgraded or modified or changed. With a Docker container, especially if you have a Docker file that you're using to build that um, that image up, you've got a, this auditable recipe of like, this is how I created that, right? So one, you've got something that's auditable. Two, once you've built it and uh, and you've registered in say a, a Docker hub, now you've got something that you can always go and pull back down. Others can pull that down and reuse that same image. So you really start to make it easy for someone that you can say, here's the analysis I did. and that that this other user from the community can go pull that image down and run the exact same thing that you did. And then, um, and also you can do that too. So a month later, a year later, if you wanna go back and reproduce those results, you just pull that image down and do that. So I think this is really powerful. And this is why I think it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna grow in adoption within the scientific community as more and more people understand what, what this enables. So w where does the name Shifter come from? <laughs> I'll let Doug take it because he came up. We we were like, what name should we call it? And uh, well, uh, so actually, uh, we we had tried a lot of different things, and one of basically, I, I think that uh, Shane originally posited that we should call it a uh, Proteus, which is a shape shifting. Yeah, uh, or something. I was thinking of some mythology kind of thing or something like yeah. that. And and I was having a I was I was having a difficult time moving off from that, and so I, I decided to sort of latch onto the shape shifting aspect yeah. of it, and that's that's really where shifter comes from. Yeah, and so we talk about like sort of shifting into an image or an environment, and so that's sort of the idea there. So of course yes. the big question for all these container-ish type systems, whether they're relying on one or implementing their own, is uh, do you require root permissions to set this up or use it? Yeah. So. Um, we so the short answer is yes we do so what what we do with uh shifter and I, I should make this clear that these were very conscious decisions we made along the way we tried a lot of different things as doug mentioned we've so been doing this for can we back up for a second and restart the question because i think i think what i'd like i think uh, can we clarify the question are you talking about does the user need root privilege privilege to introduce a container onto the system or do you need root privilege uh, in to the install the software to set it up or to install the software or let's just clarify what you're yeah uh, sorry actually i was asking both okay all right so okay so um yeah shifter does require some level of root root privileges so the short answer is yes um 
we went through a lot of different iterations when we were developing Shifter because, like Doug mentioned, we've been sort of doing this for almost a decade now. So let me explain where we where we need privileges and why. Well, um, so one of the the main thing is the binary that does the runtime construction uh, for the user. It needs to have root privileges, so it's a set UID binary, and that's so that it can do a loopback mount of the the file system. So what we do with Shifter is we take the image, the Docker image, we unpack it, we repack it, and squash it in like I say a squashFS um, file format, place it out on the parallel file system, and then at runtime when the user wants to use that image, they'll we loop, loop, mount that up to a loopback mount, and so that requires privileges. Uh, the rest of the operations don't, so we um, we will uh, drop privileges once we've done the the things that require it. So, at no no time in any part where the user has control do they have privileges. So we that's why we can do things like allow them to access their their file systems, access the parallel file systems. But uh, there is this caveat that we need uh, a set UID binary just to perform that main operation. Okay, so just, just to drive that point home, the system gunk on the back end requires some root level permissions to set things up. But mm -hmm. from the user's perspective, they just say, use my container and it's running as them and they never any see the root level gunk setup stuff. They're just their user outside the computer and then they're, I'm sorry, outside the container and then their user inside the container, no root required for them at all. That's correct. And you know, we've, this was really important for us, right? Because we're running a system that's got thousands of users on it. We can't allow a user to potentially access somebody else's data, corrupt it, whatever. Now, obviously, we want to secure the systems too. So, similar to the way, you know, say a resource manager kind of has to do its job. It needs privileges to be able to set up the the run and then move into that and uh, switch to that user to start the job up. It, you know, that's kind of what we're doing here with Shifter as well. But then also the user, <clears throat> but because of some of this and the way that, that Shifter is designed, and this is one of the major design points of Shifter is that at least in the way that we've implemented it in NERSC, although their, Shifter gives the site a lot of flexibility to configure mm -hmm. Shifter however they want, uh, there is no need at, at the NERSC site, at least with the way that we've configured our Shifter installation, for a user to do something like file a ticket or, or, or something else to get a new container on, on, on yeah. the system. So, yeah. so long as they put their image out on Docker Hub, they can at, at any time pull down that image and start running with it under their own control. Yeah, that's right. Now, you also mentioned that Shifter gives you some scalability controls. I think we've got the security part down. What kind of scalability advantages do you get? Yeah. Well, so this was actually, it was by design to be sure, but it was not actually, performance was not one of our initial goals with Shifter. It was mostly about productivity. Yeah, scientist productivity. Uh, you know, I want to build I want to build my environment and then produce it. But the, the choice of how we pack the image mm -hmm. and then put it at least onto our parallel file system. And, you know, we, we've done a lot of tuning to get that just right for our, our installation. Mm -hmm. um, but then using this, this loop device mount, it turns out that that optimizes out um, one of the most challenging aspects of delivering software in, in very large HPC environments, uh, which is that, uh, for example, on our system, if you wanted to start up a, a simple uh, Python MPI application mm -hmm. um, across, say, a thousand nodes, uh, we've seen that take as long as 28 minutes if, it was, if it's done na naively. Mm -hmm. But running that same code through Shifter, uh, it only takes seven seconds to launch. Mm. And the reason for that is that by distributing the image and locally mounting the image, it doesn't copy the data to the compute node, but it copies the metadata of the file system to the compute node. Yeah. And so as Python is starting up and walking its hundreds of directories and files and everything in Python path, so long as it's within the container environment, it gets much faster access and doesn't need to get locks from the from the central file system yeah. and all the other stuff that goes along with that. Yeah, you think about it, normally it'd have to go to something like, in our case, we're running Lustre on these systems and we also run GPFS. It'd have to go to those metadata servers to start accessing files. Really, you just have to do one lookup to get the image, then you mount it into the kernel namespace of the compute node, and now everything's in that sort of local kernel space, so it can be very efficient. 
We mount the image up read only, so that has some downsides to it, but it does allow it to scale more efficiently. And then there's some other things that we've done that um, we integrate it with the batch. Uh, we can integrate with the batch system, and when that's done, that can give you some additional scalability uh, features. In that case, what happens is that um, all of the processes that are started by the workload manager can basically share the same namespace, so we don't have you know, to repay the overhead of setting up Shifter again and again and again. Yeah, which is still low, but you know it does add something. So how do you handle the file systems and mapping in usernames and stuff like that? So you said that you're you're handling it, you're the same user inside the container as outside, but how is that actually accomplished? So the, the shifter executable, so the, and the job of the shifter executable is to sort of launch a process inside the container environment. And what it does is it actually collects all of the user information credentials uh, from the external environment. Um, and then it just, when it drops privileges, it, is, it assumes all the same identities. Mm -hmm. So there is no, no change in, in privilege outside from inside the environment. Um, one of the things that we do uh, with Shifter, though, is you know, we said that we bring in things like uh, the shared parallel file systems. Now, clearly, the user doesn't have those mount points probably in their, in their image. Um, so a big part of what Shifter does is it actually, at runtime, edits the container uh, that the user has presented. So the Shifter does not give the user the container that they requested. It gives the user a version of the container that they requested based on site policy. And so uh, the site can set up the, the Shifter configuration file uh, to, to say, well, uh, this content needs to be copied into the container, or these mount points need to exist, and these file system mounts need to exist. and then. That's, and that's really what the shifter executable is sort of legislating, is, 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 is how the container is set up and how uh, it's expressed to the user. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're, once you're in the container, you're, you're, you're whatever user was that requested the container, you're that user. And so there's really no additional mapping that needs to be done in that case. So this, this probably wouldn't happen, but say they're executable in all their environments inside that container. And when that container was built, it was built under a UID different than their own, and it does not have world permissions on it. Do they mm -hmm. basically get a permission denied when they try to invoke it on a machine that's enforcing these policies, or does that, it do something different? Yeah, that's that's correct. I mean, this is, and it's probably worth noting there are because of these, you know, some of the things that we do in Shifter for security reasons, it can cause some incompatibilities with a Docker image if it's not constructed um, quite the right way. So, for example, I've seen cases where people have the software is all installed as root. It's put in the root home directory, and then they go to try to run that container, and they're like, "I can't open, I can't op access these files." It works when I run it in Docker. So, it, luckily, these are very easy to work around. You know, generally, what we say is, "Okay, just make sure you make any files you need to be able to access. Just make sure those are read, um, you know, world ex executable, world readable, and then everything uh, pretty much works." We generally recommend people put um, put the applications in standard paths. You might as well. You, it's your container. You don't have to put it in some oddball path. So it sometimes people need to do a little bit of work in the image to get it to, to be compatible with Shifter, but usually those are pretty straightforward. One of the things that we feel is that a container that's done well mm -hmm. or, you know, for, for, this, for this environment really should re not require a complex environment at all. Uh, if your path is more exciting than, you know, bin colon user bin, or, and your LD library path has to be anything other than empty, it's you probably have made it more complicated than it needed to be. So really, like, a common complaint where people are like, I can just yum install this or, or set everything up the way I would on my home machine where everything's in user bin, user local bin, and everything just works, I should do that inside my container image and then I can have that same experience anywhere. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think part of the problem is people just aren't used to thinking that way, right? They've always been constrained, so they don't think about like, well, I just should make it look the way I wish it were, would look. Okay, so uh, one of the things that uh, I understand about Docker, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that when you have this Docker specification file, it actually goes and builds your container on the fly um, to potentially include like what Brock just said, like yum install, whatever. Um, probably OpenMPI, because all right-thinking people use OpenMPI. Um, so 
does that happen on your system too? And does that happen on each compute node? Like, is that distributed or is it centralized? How does that happen? Yeah, so maybe it's worth noting here that first off um, with, with Docker, there's kind of two stages to the Docker lifecycle, right? One stage is you build an image and that's where the Docker file that you mentioned sort of comes into play. That's a recipe for how this image should look. So it says things like inside this build environment, add these packages, um, you know, set these environment variables, uh, you know, run these commands. And then if the, the result of that is an image, right? And then you could push that to a registry like Docker Hub. Now what, and then the second phase of Docker is you run, you know, you run an instance of that image that's a container, right? So what we're doing in Shifter is we're trying to leverage as much of that as we can. So we don't want to provide a bunch of tools to build images because there are already good tools to do that. Docker provides those. And we don't want to build our own registry because Docker provides that. So what we do is uh, we have a special component that's part of Shifter where it will pull down the contents of the image, which are really just a bunch of tar files. It unpacks those, repacks them, and then squashes them into a single squash um, file system uh, file. And then that's placed onto the global file system for the HPC system. And so you only incur that penalty once when you first pull the image. Now it's packed and ready to go. And whenever you start up a, a container using the shifter runtime, it just mounts that image in on the compute node. So there's no additional translation or conversions that have to happen. The user is able to cause an image to be pulled. So they get control when they build their image mm -hmm. and they get control to say, I need this particular image on the system, but it's entirely system software um, and system administrator configured software that is actually handling uh, the image itself at that point. So the, the user doesn't ever actually have direct control over the, the image once it starts to come onto our system. Yeah. So we're, we're doing a decent bit of work with Docker here at Michigan for supporting things like persistent databases, data science applications, and others, not mm -hmm. on our you know big shared resources, but persistent services we provide. And a common thing we ran across is friends don't let friends use loopback. And I've noticed you've mentioned that a couple of times. Um, what is different about this sort of environment that you consider loopback to be okay? Obviously, it, it works on pretty much any Linux system out there. Is it because you're not doing any I.O. internal to the container? Everything is you know, mapped out to these external file systems? Yeah, I would say that's the primary reason. You know, If we had local disk, perhaps we could copy it on and then mount it up as a native file system or something like that. But um, we, we think in general that the loopback trick has been great for us. We've used it in a number of ways. We're seeing it even get picked up uh, outside of you know, Docker kind of use cases now. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, it, you know, it's something you have to be cautious with, but I don't think it should be um, feared. Well, and really, the, you know, the question on this is what is the rate limiting step that you're, su that you're suffering from? And, and what we were, the problem that we were having was, uh, was metadata operations traversing the, the, um, the parallel file system. Mm -hmm. So by using the loop, loop device, we actually now make the loop device the rate limiting step, which uh, even then is still more page transfer than anything else, you know, to and from to get the to get the data. So the loop device, sure, it causes an it causes a penalty of a, of a kind, but the only place it's really causing the penalty is an application startup, and application startup is not where you should be spent. It's not where ideally an HPC application should be so should be spending most of its time. Uh, you know, any sort of uh, persistent, you know, read and write uh, operations should not be targeted at the container. In fact, we prevent that by making it uh, a read-only file system. Uh, instead, those should be, you know, obviously directed to more traditional I/O mechanisms, MPI or sh shared memory, or even the parallel file system itself, which is tuned for being able to accept large amounts of reads and writes very efficiently, but not perhaps these locking operations with metadata. So uh, you just gave me the keyword there to, to move us to a slightly different topic here. How do you handle um, these OS bypass networks and uh, HPC class networks, whatever whatever you want to use the, the phrase here? Um, how do you handle MPI and all the extra special things that it does inside of a container? Does that present any problems as opposed to bare metal? Yeah, so, I, you know, I think... 
when we first started developing Shifter, we were really targeting sort of these uh, kind of high throughput type applications, more data intensive applications. But at the same time, we wanted to be able to use this for MPI style and traditional simulation type workloads as well. So we started looking at ways to do this. And there are a couple of different ways. One, it's important to know, we just passed through the device um, file system. So inside the container, you still have access to those devices. You're still that user, so you don't have any extra privileges, but you can access them. So the other key thing that you sort of touched on that you have to deal with is, well, you know, a lot of times these are, the hardware is very specific. It might have a version of firmware on it, and you need to match that to some degree in your runtime, right? So one model would be, well, you just have to keep your image up to date with the system you're going to run in. So if you need a version of, you know, RDMA libraries to match your OFED release or something, you got to make sure those are in the image. And that's one model. We have another model that we support in Shifter that Doug really figured out the way to, to work this, where we um, we place the, the libraries, we take advantage of ABI compatibility, for example, in an M MPI. We put the libraries that are that are sort of part of the system and match to the, the hardware in a, in a location on the system, and then we volume out those into the container and set the LD library path so those get picked up at runtime. So that way they're automatically mapped in and used uh, you know, by the MPI application, for example. Let me make sure I understand what you just said there. So you're saying that like, uh, I, I have a container um, and I'm running, uh, I don't know, Red Hat 7.4, and um, you're saying that you have like an MPI installed for Red Hat 7.4 or 7X, just taking care, uh, taking advantage of the ABI for Red Hat 7X, and that gets mapped into my container so I don't have to do anything for it? Is that what you mean? Almost. What, what we would do is we have some example containers that already have it sort of set up the right way, but, it, and I'll, I'll be frank with you here, Jeff, we, we have this working for mPitch on our systems. We haven't yet had it work for OpenMPI, but there's no technical barriers other than just some details of the Cray systems and sort of the state of the fabrics. But anyway, what we do is the user in their image would have a build of MPI that has the, it's a sufficient level to have the ABI compatibility. And then the only thing that needs to get volume mounted and mapped into that uh, container space is just the libraries, you know, the correct libraries for say the Ares interconnect or the, you know, the InfiniBand interconnect of the system. So you know, we, we, we accomplished this with our, with Shifter's ability to inject inject content into the image yeah and then and then it's really just we rely on the linker to do its job with dynamic linking and so this is sort of at least at large scale hpc this is sort of a novel concept you know using dynamic linking uh most of the state of the art has been static linking for a long time well statically produced binaries um and so we are actually taking advantage of dynamic linking to, to provide this compatibility and this is actually itself enabled by sort of that earlier observation that the we can now traverse large amounts of files quickly uh, in application setup with the way that we do things. The thing to keep in mind with the, the, the type of system that we're working with relative to perhaps other systems is that we don't have any local disk at all. The entire OS itself is re on a remote disk on these compute nodes. The types of pressures on the system are a little different perhaps than a, uh, than a locally installed cluster would have. So our GPUs basically handled the same way? Yeah, that's right. Um, so, we, and at NERSC, uh, we're, we mainly have uh, Xeon nodes and uh, uh, nice landings nodes, KNL nodes, but, or FIS, but we are uh, another partner on this project is CSCS, and I think it's important to call them out. They've been a, a strong proponent and they've contributed to the project. And they, they have large, as you know, Pizdon has a, a very large GPU system. So they've been doing a lot of work to get GPU support within Shifter. And they've demonstrated that. And they have most of the uh, pieces uh, worked out. We're in the process of getting that. They have their own fork of it that they've been doing a lot of that development on. And we're in the process of trying to integrate that work into the upstream branches now. But it uses the basic similar concepts as what we're using for MPI. So let me, again, make sure I understand this because this is complicated stuff here. So is the idea that your containers are really just mapping 
the the file system because there's a bunch of different uh, namespace types in Linux, right? And and the word container is actually somewhat amorphous. Most people usually mean Docker containers, but there's all kinds of different flavors of them out there. Uh, are you using all of those namespaces or just the file system ones so that you don't have to do anything special to get devices? Or how, how uh, could so, you explain so, that a little bit? Yeah, so really, Shifter is not a container solution. Shifter is is a is a bunch of file system mounts and a cheroot. Yeah, or I mean, or or a namespace call. But yeah, to an, with the, a bunch the, of logic to 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 manipulate the, the 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 target environment. So in our sort of shared space uh, version of Shifter, so you know where you might have multiple jobs running the same node, we do use the the, the mount namespace for that version. But for a node exclusive shifter where you want the container to be somewhat re-entrant and things like that, we don't even use that. Yeah, there it is just the cheroot. Yeah. But yeah, uh, Jeff, to your, to your point, we mainly use file system namespaces. We don't use any of the networking related ones or process related ones. Or uh, at, at present, we don't use any of the user, user namespaces as well. Because largely because we don't see a need for most of those in HPC environments. Yeah. So you've mentioned Cray systems a lot, and Cray's kind of has special runtimes and everything else. Uh, this, and I also know CSE has a lot of Cray's. So does this require a Cray runtime environment, or can this work on classic, you know, uh, x86 clusters? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that, because that is a misconception. I think, I think a lot of people, because we've partnered with Cray in some of this work, they think it only works on craze. But no, we have examples out there of people. We're running it ourselves on uh, some standard clusters, and then there are other sites that are running it on uh, regular clusters as well. OK, so th then my next question is a follow-up, kind of getting back to the GPUs and the MPI. What about shared memory applications? Uh, when I've seen a lot of these sorts of systems, you still use your job launch system, but they tend to still do you know process per core. Um, you know, how how do you handle launching one of these things where you want to do a threaded or an OpenMP application? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, the brief answer is we're not doing shifters, mostly manipulating the file system namespace and some the environment setup, you know, like environment variables. Uh, it's not doing uh, anything to, to monkey around with some of these other things. So shared memory space, as long as the user has access to it, they, it should behave the same way. Yeah, we port through all of slash dev. We don't do anything to obscure slash dev shemem. Um, there, un, unless there is a very exotic implementation, and even then the site could configure Shifter to bring in, so actually that is the case for a Cray system, is that there are a number of paths that need to be brought through to make Cray's XPMEM stuff uh, work properly, and Cray's um, sort of <clears throat> RDMA credentialing system work correctly. And so long as those are exposed within the container file system environment, everything just works. Mm -hmm. Okay, so still just use your resource manager to launch Shifter the same way you would have had it launch a process that you ported directly natively to the platform. That's correct. Yeah, that's right. In fact, when you run a Shifter um, a container image, the way it looks is, you know, in your batch job, you would say, instead of saying, for example, ours on Slurm, you might say, S run, you know, binary name. In this case, you just say S run shifter binary name, and that's pretty much the the end of it. So a couple episodes ago, we talked to Greg Kurtzer about Singularity, which is another HPC based container uh, project. I wonder, could you compare and contrast Shifter and Singularity to explain a a little bit of the differences between them? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and it's it's. Kind of ironic because both of these, Greg, he's no longer uh, at Berkeley Lab, but when he was developing Singularity was, and, and we're at Berkeley Lab too. So it's a little bit odd that two different solutions came out of the same same place. But we actually had started Shifter work quite a while back, and then uh, they, they were different. They were more different at one time. They've slowly kind of converged. So I'd say if I had to sort of say what's the chief difference between them, uh, I think the biggest one is uh, Shifter has this concept of an image gateway that we sort of maintain a central repository of any of the images that have been pulled in to be used, right? So any user can pull the images in, but they go into a common location. And we sort of main, the system maintains control over those images over their lifetime. 
So we think this is important because we've even heard of cases in some of these others where somebody will accidentally corrupt the image uh, after they've pulled it and then they go to run it and it'll break or it might break ones that are already running. Since we sort of maintain control of that, we, ne we make sure that we never overwrite an image that's already been successfully pulled and registered. So I would say, you know, the fact that we have this central repository and the fact that we maintain control over the images is probably one of the, the biggest differences. Uh, some of the other things is we've done a lot of work to integrate this with batch systems. So, uh, you know, here we're running Slurm. We've got really good integration with Slurm, but people have done it with other batch and resource managers as well. I think uh, Singularity's got some examples of that now with Slurm as well, but, um, you know, we've been doing this a little bit longer. And there's a few other kind of minor sort of feature differences that I think are intriguing. Um, one of which is we can allow the user to create a file, the, a, a per node file that can get mounted into the image on the compute node that's writable. And so this is not visible across all the nodes, uh, you know, that might be using that image. It's just local to that node, but this is a good way to kind of emulate local disk type uh, performance in a system where you might not have any local disk like we do on our craze. So that's a small, uh, that's a feature that was actually pretty powerful that I think is still pretty unique to, uh, to Shifter. So one of the things you're talking about was the ability of Shifter to be able to take, you know, IOP intensive startup applications like, uh, you know, MPI for Pi applications and things like that and really scale up some of these systems. So what's the largest job that you know of that's been started up under a shifter environment? So actually just last week, and we got permission from the people that, that did this to talk a little, a little bit about it, um, the, uh, they were able to run on uh, 9,600 uh, Intel KNL nodes uh, with shifter, and they were running a Python uh, wrapped uh, application to simulate their next generation, um, I think it was the cosmic microwave background. Yeah. And so that was a that was a single job uh, run through Shifter. It was an MPI job uh, that ran with uh, over uh, I think 158,000 ranks um, across the system. That is, I think, the current largest. And that that did real science, and they were able to uh, collect enough, simulate enough data to to really sort of plan out their next generation. Uh, data collection capability, which is, you know, I think that they said the Planck satellite had 70 data collectors and the next version is going to have 50,000 data collectors. Yeah, it's like 35x the data output or something on Planck. Yeah. So we've done, uh, you know, dynamic benchmark style runs ourselves to kind of make sure things are working correctly. But this was probably the biggest real science example that we've, we've come across. And so it's pretty cool. But that, that's just in a single example. What Shifter's also done on our systems is enabled entire new workflows that now just run in production all the time. And so if you were to, if you were to sum up the compute time dedicated, I would say that the high energy physics community has probably benefited the most at NERSC from Shifter. Yeah. Because they're able to now package up their applications, uh, have it work, uh, excuse me, not their applications, their entire uh, framework of software. Uh, and those images uh, tend to, uncompressed, would exceed over a terabyte in size. And they're able to package those up and now make you full use of, of Cori uh, to, do their, to, do their, to do their work. Um, so that, I, you know, those are the kinds of things that we really wanted to do with Shifter is uh, enable that. Now, by the same token, and this is a question we ask a lot of our, our guests on here too, is what is the strangest use of, or the, you know, the most unexpected thing that you've seen Shifter used for? And, and perhaps this is a, something outside of NERSC because you're using it a lot in production, but you know, have you gotten a strange user request from someone saying, hey, I'm using Shifter this way, and you're like, wow, never thought that would happen. Yeah, I don't know if we've got any things that are just really absurdly strange. I think we've seen ones like Doug mentioned that um, uh, where the LHC folks are using it. And this is kind of uh, what they're doing is if you've ever heard of CVMFS, this is their distributed kind of file system that the LHC folks use. Uh, what, they, what they've done is they take the whole distribution of CVMFS and create one big mega squash image from it. And they don't push it through Docker because it's just too big. We have mechanisms in Shifter to allow you to directly import that and sort of register it in the system. So 
that's probably you know just by sheer counts is the one of the stranger ones but um you know i think as more people use it we'll probably come across some some more oddball uses of it but to be sure we don't know all the use cases we can certainly see a list of all the images that people are using and there are there are many users accessing shift around the system today most mostly they seem to be not filing tickets so um. yeah <laughs> we're not always aware of how, how they're using it until after the fact so what license is Shifter developed under? Yeah, so it is an open source project. It's uh, up on GitHub at uh, github.com slash nurse slash Shifter. And it's under a BSD, a, a modified BSD license, which is the lab's kind of preferred preferred choice. Uh, and we think this is a good license choice too, because it's easy for, if vendors want to kind of pick it up and maybe uh, support it themselves, there's more latitude there. So what are some interesting things that are happening in the Shifter community? What what do you have coming up in, what new features do you have coming up in new releases and things? <laughs> yeah, well, we've been trying to get a new release out for a, a few months now. Doug has been distracted with a, a small, you know, 10,000 node plus system that he has to help support and make operate. So, um, but uh, we're hoping to get a release out very soon. Some of the things that that release we already have these things working, so we're just really trying to get it buttoned up. But that adds private image uh, support. So there are cases where people have images they don't want to make fully public. And so this will add support for that. Um, there's some metrics capabilities and in, built into it now, number of runtime sort of enhancements. So that's right on the horizon, um, you know, hopefully within a month or so or less. Also, it adds the uh, GPU. It'll be adding the GPU support that CSCS has been really instrumental in. Uh, the other thing that uh, further out, what we're looking at is uh, we want to start leveraging LayerFS uh, support to do some more clever things. We mentioned that the nodes are the, the images are mounted up read only on the nodes, and with LayerFS, we think we can provide some read write capabilities as well, which will make it a little more flexible than it currently is. So those are probably some of the bigger things. Oh, we're also working on uh, more integrated support. I mentioned these cases where we want to import images that are maybe already prepped. Uh, so we've we've got some work underway to try to make that uh, a little more streamlined and user friendly. Okay, guys, thanks very much for your time. Uh, where can people find Shifter, download it, and get involved? Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, the probably the best source is to go to the GitHub site. Uh, if you Google, uh, we've, there's some pages on the NERSC website as well. Um, I forget the exact pass, but if you Google it, it'll, it'll show up. And we do have a mailing list uh, that um, people can subscribe to, as well as uh, if you're really going to get involved in development or something like that, we have a Slack channel that we can invite people to to help contribute. But our, our the, the, you know, the model is similar to how other open source projects work. Uh, you can fork it, make a PR against that, and we'll review it and hopefully incorporate it. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for your time, guys. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having us. Glad we got to talk about it.